Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's session of Maxwell Lectures, and thank you for joining us. I'm Shireen from Maxwell Chambers, your host for today. Our speaker who is joining us is Professor Bernard Hanatil, and he will be speaking on the topic, Res Judicata and the Could Have Been Claims. Hi, Professor Hanatil, it's nice to have you here. How is your day going? Very good, thank you. Right, so we're really excited to hear from you. So now I'll just turn the e-stage over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a great honor and a great pleasure for me to make today this uh, presentation on res judicata and the could have been claims. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, res judicata is an issue to which arbitral tribunals are more and more often confronted in international arbitration. Uh, it raises many different sub-issues, and in particular, the following ones. What is the law applicable to the res judicata issue? Is it limited to the dispositive part of the award, or does it extend to the reasoning? Under what conditions does res judicata apply? In particular, should arbitral tribunal strictly apply the tri triple identity test, same parties, same subject matter, and same cause of action, or should they apply a broader, more autonomous approach? As I will demonstrate, the tendency today is towards a broader, more autonomous conception of res judicata, which tends to prohibit claim splitting and also encompasses the could have been claims, claims that could have been raised in the first arbitration, were not and are eventually invoked in a subsequent case. Next slide, please. My presentation will be divided in five parts after a brief introduction and a brief overview of res judicata in national legal systems, legislations on arbitration and institutional rules. I will address the law applicable to the res judicata issue, followed by the issue of the scope, and in particular, whether res judicata is limited to the dispositive part of the award or also extends to the reasoning. And finally, I will explain that there is an increasing trend to apply an autonomous approach to res judicata, an approach which prohibits claim splitting and encompasses the could have been claims. Next slide, please. Res judicata means subject to nuance that once adjudicated, a claim cannot be raised again. Two fundamental principles underlie the doctrine of res judicata, the interest of the state that there be an end to litigation, and the fact that no person should be sued twice for the same cause. The main purpose of the doctrine is to avoid repetitious and wasteful litigation. Res judicata is a principle of international law and even a general principle of law within the meaning of Article 38.1c of the Statute of International, the International Court of Justice. It involves considerations of public policy and justice. As pointed out by Gary Bourne, and I quote, deeply rooted considerations of public policy underlie rules of preclusion in national and international law. These policies focus on the injustice of permitting a party to relitigate the same claims and issues against an adversary in repeated proceedings, imposing both litigation cost and risk, as well as on the damage that such tactics cause to the credibility and resources of the legal systems. It is also commonly accepted that arbitral awards have res judicata effect. This is logical since one of the fundamental objectives of international arbitration 
is to provide a final binding resolution of the parties' disputes. Res judicata is accepted in all the developed legal systems. However, as we will see, its scope may vary from one system to another. Next slide, please. In common law jurisdictions, the rule of preclusion are largely based on judicial authority. In England, the existence of a decision that is res judicata may give rise to four preclusive pleas, cause of action estoppel, issue estoppel, former recovery, and abuse of process. Cause of action estoppel prevents a party in subsequent litigation from asserting or denying the existence of a particular cause of action, the existence or non-existence of which has been determined in previous litigation between the same parties. Issue estoppel, which is also referred to as issue preclusion or collateral estoppel, is a plea that may be raised when fundamental legal or factual issues finally determined in an earlier proceeding are raised in later proceedings. Former recovery is a plea that the party in whose favor release and relief has been granted is now attempting to reassert the same claim in order to obtain further relief. And the last one is very interesting because it is linked to the topic of my presentation. Anderson versus Anderson. Abuse of process is based in common law uh, jurisdictions on the rules set out in Anderson versus Anderson. It requires the parties, when a matter becomes the subject of litigation between them, to bring their whole case before the court so that all aspects of it may be finally decided once and for all. The doctrine prevents a party from splitting its claims or in other words, seeking a second bite at the sherry. Common law jurisdictions have therefore an expansive conception of claims that has the effect of extending the preclusive effects of res judicata well beyond the claims that have been litigated to also reach claims that might have been litigated but were not. In civil law countries, the rules of preclusion are usually codified in statutes. They are often conceived more restrictively on the, on the basis of a triple identity requirement, same parties, same claim, same legal grounds. However, the tendency recently of many courts or, or arbitral tribunal is to give these concepts a rather extensive interpretation. For example, in France, which is an emblematic example of the classic triple identity test, the approach has begun to evolve in favor of a broader and more pragmatic approach, which would be less formalistic. In domestic litigation, the French Supreme Court has indeed imposed what is referred to as the principle of concentration. Claimants must present from the outset of the proceedings all the grounds on which they consider their claims to be justified. This tendency to a more extensive interpretation has been reflected in the law of various countries. For example, in Belgium, my jurisdiction, which also adheres to the, to the triple identity test, the law has been slightly amended in 2015. The claim must still be based on the same issue, but, and I quote, whatever the legal ground which is alleged. The Belgian legislator has therefore opted for an extensive conception of the concept of issue, like the Italian and German lawmakers. The emphasis in what in, uh, is on what was claimed the first time, whatever the legal grounds invoked by the parties. In civil law jurisdictions, is res judicata limited to the dispositive part of the award or does it extend to reasons? In principle, only the operative part has res judicata, but 
the reasons of the judgment may be used to interpret the operative part and serve to clarify the meaning and scope of what has been decided. And in various jurisdictions like France or Belgium, it has been decided that not only the formal pronouncements are res judicata, but also the secondary issues that have been resolved by the court in the process of reaching, reaching its decision and which would deprive the decision of its logical basis if they were to be denied. Finally, it is common ground that arbitral awards are res judicata, have res judicata effects. It is, provide, it is so provided by Article 3 of the New York Convention or Articles 53, 1 and 54, 1 of the ICSID Convention. It is also mentioned in various institutional rules, for example, Article 35-6 of the 221 ICC rules, Article 26.8 of the 2020 LCIA rules, Article 34-2 of the 2013 ANSI rules, and Article 30.1 of the SIAC rules. The res judicata effect of arbitral award is also confirmed in the legislations of all leading civil law countries. On the other hand, it appears that nowhere in a statute of a common law country it is stated that an arbitral award has res judicata, like a judgment, although it is not disputed. In England, for example, Article 58 of the 1996 Arbitration Act states that the award is final and binding. Next slide. What is the law applicable to the res judicata issue? Well, in the first place, it is admitted in a majority of jurisdictions that res judicata, which is an issue of admissibility, is a procedural question. Indeed, it is a rule of evidence in common law jurisdictions, and it is codified in procedural codes in civil law jurisdictions. I understand, however, that Singapore is an exception. The traditional doctrine of res judicata in Singapore is considered to be substantive, but, and I will come back to it later, the extended doctrine is to the best of my knowledge, generally considered procedural. If res judicata is a procedural question, as it is the case in most jurisdiction, the lex arbitrary is relevant to determining the res judicata rules that shall apply. In an article on res judicata published in 2004, Judge Dominique Acher, member of the French Supreme Court and also a member of the International Commercial Court of Singapore, has concluded that there was a predominant connection to the law of the seed as the law giving res judicata to an award rendered in a prior arbitration. This has also been confirmed more recently by Professor Kai Ober in his course on res judicata and lease pendants in international arbitration at the Hague Academy of International Law. He refers to the, and I quote, the inclination of some tribunals to rely on the lex for I when interpreting and applying the principle of res judicata. Reference can also be made to a number of arbitral awards. Applying the lex arbitri to international arbitration means in practice that if a first award has been rendered in France and a second arbitration is started in Singapore, the res judicata issue will be decided in accordance with the law of Singapore. To be exhaustive, I should, however, mention that if the application of the lex arbitri is usually the reference to decide the res judicata issue, Ms. Sylvia Schaffstein, in a recent study on the law governing res judicata, concludes that even, that even if a majority of arbitral tribunals have applied the res judicata principles of the place of arbitration, a few of them have applied the law governing the merits or the disputes, and others have applied sui generis international 
Precusion principles in an effort to find pragmatic solutions. And indeed, as I will demonstrate, there is an increasing trend among doctrinal authorities to advocate the application of transnational principles to the issue of res judicata. Next slide, please. What is the scope of res judicata? The scope of res judicata concerns the issue whether it is limited to the operative part of the award or also to the reasoning. In principle, res judicata applies only to the operative part of the award, that is the part of the award containing the decision. It does not normally extend to the reasons which will only be taken into consideration to determine the meaning and scope of the operative part. However, it is generally considered that res judicata extends to the reasons which are the necessary adjunct of the decision, that is to say, the ratio decidendi of the award. In other words, the fact that the ratio decidendi is located in the body of the award rather than its, in its operative part is irrelevant. For example, this issue has been addressed in an award of 28 March 1984 in ICC case number uh, 3267. And in this case, the arbitral tribunal has decided as follows, and I quote, the binding effect of the first award is not limited to the contents of the order thereof adjudicating or dismissing certain claims, but it extends to the legal reasons that were necessary for such order, that is, to the ratio decidendi of such award. Irrespective from the academic views that may be entertained on the extent of the principles of res judicata on the reasons of a decision, it would be unfair to both parties to depart in a final award from the views held in the previous award to the extent they were necessary for the disposition of certain issues. Finally, a related issue is whether and to what extent an arbitral tribunal should take into consideration an award rendered in another connected arbitration, which is not res judicata. This issue has been addressed in various arbitral awards. The answer is that even if the arbitral tribunal in the second arbitration is not bound by the decision made in the first one, it should, for reasons of consistency, take into consideration the findings made by this first award. This is, for example, what has been decided in ICC case number 7061. In this case, the tribunal indeed concluded as follows. This arbitration tribunal is not bound by the X award. There can be no issue estoppel. Nonetheless, it provides a helpful analysis of the common factual background to this dispute. <clears throat> Accordingly, we have borne its findings and conclusions in mind, whilst taking care to reach our own conclusions on the material submitted by these parties in these proceedings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I will now uh, approach the fact that there is an increasing trend to apply an autonomous approach to res judicata. Indeed, it is clear that the international trend is in favor of a broad conception of res judicata. It is supported by many authors who advocate such a broad approach based on the objectives and expectations of the parties, the arbitration agreement, and particularly the party's presumptive desire to resolve all their disputes in a single centralized proceedings. They emphasize that this broad approach should go beyond the narrow and formalistic notions 
that traditionally apply in continental systems. This broad approach has also been confirmed <clears throat> by the 2006 recommendations on lease pendants and res judicata and arbitration adopted in Toronto by the International Law Association. <clears throat> The International Law Association report and recommendations are the culmination of a four-year project administered by the International Commercial Arbitration Committee of the International Law Association, which comprises 50 members, I'm one of them, leading scholars and practitioners from all over the world. The International Law uh, Report Association report advocates an autonomous transnational approach to res judicata in, in arbitration. The International Law Association Committee has issued seven recommendations which are directed to arbitral tribunals. And I quote, with a view to facilitate uniformity and consistency in the interpretation and application of provisions and principles concerning the conclusive and preclusive effects of a prior arbitral award. The recommendations advocate an autonomous approach to res judicata. For example, recommendation number two provides that, and I quote, the conclusive and preclusive effects of arbitral awards need not necessarily be governed by national law and may be governed by transnational rules applicable to international commercial arbitration. And this approach is justified in the final report by the need to take into consideration, and I quote, the differences between international commercial arbitration and domestic court dispute settlement as well as the international character of arbitration, which should not be reduced to domestic notions regarding res judicata that are valid in a domestic setting, but are hardly relevant in an international concept. The recommendations do not limit res judicata preclusion to situations where a claim has already been litigated Recommendation number five provides that, and I quote, an arbitral award has preclusive effects in the further arbitral proceedings as to a claim, cause of action, or issue of fact or law, which could have been raised, but was not in the proceedings re resulting in the award, provided that the raising of any such new claim, cause of action, or new issue of fact of, or law amounts to procedural unfairness or abuse. Recommendation number five has been justified as follows, and I quote, policy objectives of efficiency and finality can also be taken into account to protect respondents from being exposed to further arbitration if a claimant fails to raise claims, cause of action, or issues of fact or law in prior proceedings. Also, there is a legitimate public interest in having a nance to, to arbitration. The doctrines of procedural fairness and abuse provide an acceptable compromise regarding the private and public interest at stake. Next slide, please. As pointed out by Audrey Shepard and Philippe Dely, respectively rapporteur and chairman of the International Law Association Committee, and I quote, international tribunals have also been aware of the risk that if they use too restrictive criteria of identity of object and grounds, the doctrine of res judicata would rarely apply. If only an exactly identical relief salt object, based on exactly the same legal arguments, grounds, in a second case, 
would be precluded as a result of res judicata, then litigants could easily evade this by slightly modifying either the relief requested or the grounds relied upon. This would be the case, for example, if in a typical investment dispute involving allegations of fact amounting to expropriation, the investor first sought restitutio in integrum as relief from the host state, and in a later litigation, changed the object of his case requesting compensation. The two authors also conclude that a dispute may be considered a single identical dispute based on identical grounds where claims are based two fairly different legal texts as long as they relate to the same factual background. And the same approach has been approved by many scholars, including Pierre Maillet, leading arbitrator and the former chairman of the International Law Association Arbitration Committee. Pierre Maillet writes, and I quote, for example, a party that has introduced, that introduced a claim for nullity of a contract for mistake and failed, could wish to present the same claim on the basis of fraud or defective formalities. In arbitration, what could consider that the party that seizes an arbitral tribunal of a certain claim loses its right to present to another arbitral tribunal, not only that claim, as specifically formulated, but also any other claim that he could and therefore should in good faith have added to the former in the course of the same procedure. Next slide. Should res judicata extend to claim splitting and the could have been claims? In other words, both situations where on the one hand, a party has lost in a first arbitration and reintroduces the same claim on a different legal background, eventually with a different quantification. And on the other hand, situations where a claimant starts a second arbitration in which he formulates a claim that he could have included in the first arbitration, but did not. The tendency today is to answer the question in the affirmative. It is to be noted in the first place that this approach is already the one adopted in the law of some jurisdictions. For example, the law of New York applies a broad conception of the res judicata doctrine referred to as the transactional approach. Under this approach, res judicata bars not only claims that have been actually disputed in a first instance, but also claims that could have been litigated in the first proceeding. This is also to some extent the case of French law, which a priori applies the triple identity test as provided in article 1355 of the French Civil Code. However, on the basis of this provision, French case law has developed a very broad approach to res judicata referred to as the concentration obligation, whereby a claimant must present from the outset of the proceedings all the grounds upon which he considers his claim to be justified. Another similar example of a broad conception of res judicata in a civil law jurisdiction is Article 400 of the Spanish Ley and Juiciamento. It provides that, and I quote, when the claims may be based on different facts or different basis or legal issues, they must be alleged by the party, provided that they are known to it or that they may be usefully raised in the proceedings and may not later be raised in another proceeding. 
in accordance with the provisions of the preceding paragraph, for the purpose of res judicata, the facts and legal basis adduced in the proceeding shall be deemed the same as those adduced or could have been adduced in a previous proceeding. Next slide, please. If we turn to the common law, in England, the notion of claim, which is subject to preclusion, is defined broadly. It includes all claims or rights of legal actions that arise out of a single set of facts or single transaction. This is an expansive conception of claims. It has the effect of extending the preclusive effects of res judicata well beyond the claims that were actually litigated concerning a, par a particular transaction in a prior litigation to reach also claims that might have been litigated but were not. In particular, the principles underlying Anderson versus Anderson are that a party is expected to bring forward its own case and except in exceptional circumstances, it is not open to that party to try to re-litigate not only points upon which the tribunal was actually required to form an opinion and pronounce a judgment, but also every point which properly belong to the subject of the arbitration and which that party exercising reasonable diligence might have brought forward at the time. Next slide, please. A similar approach prevails in Singapore where a distinction is made between the traditional doctrine of res judicata and the extended doctrine of res judicata. The traditional doctrine of res judicata covers cause of action estoppel and issue estoppel. On the other hand, the extended doctrine of res judicata prevents a party from raising points that were not raised but could and should have been raised in a previous proceeding. The extended doctrine finds its origin in the English Anderson versus Anderson rule that I have just mentioned, and therefore falls under the umbrella of the abuse of process doctrine. The issue is of whether a party is abusing the process of the tribunal by seeking to raise before it an issue which could and should have been raised before. In AKN versus ALC, Chief Justice Menon wrote, and I quote, just as finality is of significance to the courts, so too it is of importance to arbitration. Thus, the court will typically not rehear matters that have already been determined in arbitration. The court may disallow a party to raise certain points in court, which it could and should have raised in arbitration. There is strong support for the view that barring special circumstances, the extended doctrine of res judicata operates to preclude the, the reopening of matters that A, are covered by an arbitration agreement, B, are arbitrable, and C, could and should have been raised by one of the parties in an earlier set of proceedings that had already been concluded. Both the traditional and the extended doctrine of res judicata follow the same purpose, as mentioned by Chief Justice Menon in RBS versus TT International, underlying the principles of issue estoppel cause of action estoppel and extended doctrine, and I quote, is the policy that litigants should not be uh, twice vexed in the same matter and that the public interest requires finality in litigation. Above all, the particular focus of the extended doctrine is the need to avoid claim splitting and therefore the abuse of the dispute resolution process. 
the focus is the, on the integrity of the proceedings. Next slide. Such a broad approach that would bar claims that were actually decided and could have been decided and that could have been decided in a prior proceeding is in line with the expectations of the parties in international arbitration. As Professor Stavros Brekulakis correctly notes, and I quote, parties resort to arbitration to have their dispute finally resolved by the award. If the issues determined in the first award were open to a fresh determination, parties' expectation of finality and repose of their dispute would be thwarted and the effectiveness of arbitration would be compromised. Gary Bourne also approves this approach, which he considers in line with the objectives and expectations of the parties' arbitration agreements. He also finds support for this approach in the New York Convention. He considers that the better view of the convention is that it should permit parties only one bite at the sherry. The same view is shared by Kai Ober in his remarkable course on list pendants and res judicata at the Hague Academy of International Law. He submits that, and I quote, the identity requirement with respect to claims is not to be understood and applied in a formalistic sense. If that were the case, parties could be encouraged to resort to so-called claim splitting. By splitting claims, parties could avoid the res judicata effect by raising a different but very similar claim in the following dispute. And this is also the opinion of a leading arbitrator, Professor Reinisch. He submits that if, and I quote, international tribunal were using two restrictive criteria of identity of object and grounds, the doctrine of res judicata would rarely apply. If only an exactly identical relief sought object based on exactly the same legal argument grounds in a second case would be precluded as a result of res judicata, then litigant could easily evade this by slightly modifying either the relief requested or the grounds relied upon. In this regard, litigants may engage in claim splitting in order to avoid the res judicata effect of a prior award by seeking a different sort of relief or by raising new grounds in support of the same claim for relief. Next slide. As I've already mentioned, the IRA recommendations also do not limit res judicata preclusion to situations where a claim has already been lit litigated. The preclusion extends to, and I quote, the further arbitral proceedings as to a claim, cause of action, or issue of fact or law, which could have been raised but was not in the proceedings resulting in the award, providing that, provided that the raising of any such new claim, cause of action, or new issue of fact or law amounts to procedural unfairness or abuse. Next slide. <clears throat> there is therefore unanimity among leading international arbitrators and scholars to extend res judicata to claim splitting and could have been claims, an approach which has also been followed by national parliaments and a number of international arbitral tribunals. One of the first cases in which this approach was followed is the Orinoco Steamship Company case. Pursuant to a, an agreement of February 1903, a mixed commission was charged with deciding claims presenting, presented by US citizens against Venezuela. And all questions on which the commissioners were in this agreement were to be finally settled by an umpire. 
And in one of these cases, the umpire found that, and I quote, every matter and point distinctly in issue and it, which was directly passed upon and determined in a certain degree and which was its ground and basis is confirmed by said judgment and the claimants are forever stopped from asserting any right or claim based in any part upon any fact actually and directly involved in the said decree. It was also approved in a landmark case, the exit case AMCO versus Indonesia decided in 1988. In that court, in that case, sorry, the court also applied the principle of issue estoppel referring to the, and I quote, general principle announced in numerous cases that a right question or fact distinctly put in issue and distinctly determined by a court of competent jurisdiction as a ground of recovery cannot be disputed. Issue estoppel was also applied by the exit tribunal in Greenberg versus Granada. The award in the first arbitration had dismissed the claims made by a Texan company against Granada alleging contractual breach of a concession agreement. In the second arbitration, the Texan company and its three shareholders alleged breach by Granada of the BIT between the USA and Granada. The triple identity test was not satisfied. This notwithstanding, the second arbitral tribunal summarily dismissed the claims made by the four claimants. The second tribunal indeed accepted Granada's submission of, of issue estoppel arising from the first award based on the ground that the legal and factual contentions on which the new claim depended had already been fully litigated in the first arbitration. The tribunal pointed out that, and I quote, a finding concerning a right question or fact may not be relitigated if in a prior proceeding, A, it was distinctly put in issue, B, the court or tribunal actually decided it, and the resolution of the question was necessary to resolving the claims before that court or tribunal. Next slide. It is also on the basis of the same principles that the NAFTA arbitral tribunal shared by a prominent arbitrator, the late Johnny Vider, in the Apotex III award applied the doctrine of res judicata. In that case, Apotex Holdings Inc. and Apotex Inc alleged that the United States had violated its obligations under NAFTA chapter 11. Apotex uh, asserted that certain of its abbreviated new drug, new drug applications qualified as investments in the United States under NAFTA article 1139. There were three awards in this case. In the first and second awards, the tribunal held that the abbreviated new drug applications did not qualify as investment and the tribunal dismissed Apotex claims in their entirety. Apotex then started the third arbitration shared by Johnny Vider and contended that the earlier awards concerned different kinds of abbreviated new drug applications. Those that were tentatively approved by the US Food and Drug Administration, as opposed to those that were finally approved. Apotex position was rejected as an impermissible claim splitting. The tribunal held that Apotex was barred from relitigating the issue. It confirmed that the operative part 
together with the underlying reasoning of the earlier awards, determined that Apotex abbreviated new drug applications did not qualify as investments under the NAFTA. And the reasoning of the tribunal was particularly interesting for the topic that we are discussing. It reads as follows, and I quote, the specific claims pleaded by Apotex Canada in the Apotex 1 and 2 arbitration are different from the specific claims made by the claimants in this arbitration. So there was a difference of claims. The former claims related to tentatively approved abbreviated new, new drug applications. This is not the specific case pleaded by the claimants in this arbitration where the abbreviated new drug applications were finally approved and where no claim as to tentatively approved abbreviated new drug applications is advanced by the claimants. Hence, the operative part read by itself and in strict isolation from the preceding, preceding reasons could not form the basis of res judicata in this arbitration. However, it is necessary to read the first two lines of the operative part in the Apotex 1 and 2 award with the tribunal's earlier relevant reasons. It is clear from these, those reasons that the parties put distinctively in issues abbreviated new drugs application generally, not limited to tentatively approved abbreviated new drug applications, but also including finally approved abbreviated new drugs application. That the tribunal actually decided that issue and that as that tribunal saw it, that decision amongst others was necessary to resolve the party's dispute before it. And the tribunal further pointed out that, and I quote, those reasons were essential to the operative part and thereby distinctly determined matters in issue in the Apotex 1 and 2 arbitration. It is impermissible to pass the two sets of claims in the two arbitrations so as artificially to distinguish one case from the other. The purpose of res judicata doctrine under international law is to put an end to litigation. And it would to, it to thwart that purpose if a party could so easily escape the doctrine by claim splitting in successive proceedings. Where it's so easy to sidestep the application of res judicata, the doctrine would be largely meaningless under international law, a risk recognized by several scholars. Next slide, please. Recommendation number four of the International Law Association follows the same line of reasoning when it sets out the scope of the res judicata effect. It extends to the determination and relief contained in the dispositive part, as well as in the reasoning necessary thereto. It also extends to the issue of fact or law, which have been arbitrated and determined by it, provided that any such determination <laughs> was essential or fundamental to the dispositive part of the arbitral award. The International Law Arbitration Committee was of the view that limiting res judicata to the dispositive part of the award was, I quote, overly formalistic and literal. In addition, recommendation 4.2 endorses the common law concept of issue preclusion, which prevents a party from re-arguing factual or legal issues which have been conclusively decided in earlier proceedings, irrespective of the identity of the parties. Next slide. By way of conclusion, I can say that all these developments clearly demonstrate that there is a growing trend in international arbitration 
to recognize the emergence of an international autonomous standard of res judicata in its application by arbitral tribunals and even national courts. And there is also an emerging consensus that this standard should be conceived broadly to include in its scope not only the claims and issues that were litigated, but also the could have been claims. I thank you very much for your attention.